Hello, hola, bonjour, annyeonghashimika. Welcome to the fifth episode of World Mediation Deacon. This is DK. I'm thrilled to have my guest today. His name is Jeremy Lack. Carl Jung studied analytic psychology in Switzerland. Jeremy Lack started to use neuropsychology in alternative dispute resolution in Switzerland. Is it a coincidence? For ordinary people like me, he is a great magician in the world of alternative dispute resolution. <laughs> Bonjour, Jeremy. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Bonjour. Very pleased to meet you, and thank you for that very kind introduction. I, I hadn't heard any of that comparison or thinking before, but it's interesting to hear. And and I'll disabuse you of everything. No similarities <laughs> and nothing. No threads to be connected there. But I'm very happy to talk about all of that. But there is some connection. You have advanced in psychology area and in Switzerland. <laughs> you know the old expression in the line in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. So uh, I just have a tiny bit of knowledge about one thing. I'm interested in it, but I think in the future we'll learn a lot more about it because I do think it's a one of the most exciting areas for um, well, obviously for conflict resolution, but it also more generally it's just one of these areas that has applications that we still don't begin to understand. Thank you so much. But it's a pleasure and thank you for the kind invitation to speak on your program. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation. And can you introduce yourself where from where you were born, raised, educated and career certainly. path you now? Certainly, certainly. So I'm born and raised in Geneva, Switzerland. I have four passports. I'm Swiss, British, US and Israeli combination of parents got me to Geneva and born here. I went to England for my studies. I qualified first as a barrister in litigation in England, but I always had a mix and that goes back to the neuroscience. I had a mixed interest in science and in law, and I decided to practice a combination of the two and did patent law and technology law and uh, went to the United States, practiced there for many years, qualified as an American patent lawyer and did US style litigation for several years. And then I moved in house, worked for a large medical device company and traveled a bit around the world, helping with different operations, acquisitions. I did some transactional work at that stage, a bit like you, DK, mm -hmm. on moving from litigation to transactional. And uh, when my second daughter was born, I was living in Grenoble in France by that stage, working for the European headquarters of this multinational. I thought I wanted to come back to Switzerland where I felt my roots were and my daughters could be based here. I liked the international environment of Geneva. So we moved back and ever since then I created Law Tech and did some other things. So I created Law Tech, which is my own firm. Roughly one third of my time is spent on startup companies who work with new technologies. One third of my time is spent as a dispute resolution practitioner. And by that, I include arbitration, but primarily mediation and all sorts of ways of avoiding and resolving conflict, sometimes combining mediation and arbitration. And finally, the last one third of my time is a bit of research. And I also have a startup of my own and I look into different ideas of how we can improve our understanding and fundamental knowledge of emotions and conflict which helped me both in my work as a lawyer and also my work for my startups. Wow, such a great story. So you have four passports. Wow. So your parents are from... So my mother came, was born in Palestine in 1933, mm -hmm. and then she was Israeli by birth when the country was created in 1948. My father was from England. Mm -hmm. And so they came to Geneva because my father was a human rights lawyer. And, but, uh, you know, it's always misleading because if you look back at one generation, it looks like it's very mixed. Mm. But if you go back two generations ago, I'm 100% Russian. Mm. And the name of my surname, Lack, was originally Lachowski. So, you know, things change from generation to generation. How about your daughter? <laughs> so my daughters only have three of the passports now. Oh, three um, passports, only three. Yeah, no, it's good. One of them lives in Paris, one's in London. And the exciting news is they both just got engaged. So I have two weddings to plan for the next two years. Wow. So your family has a quite an international. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, not so simple to organize. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but it's interesting. We live in interesting times, is all I can say. <laughs> And perhaps the only thing that I should add is that I have 
great respect for the Korean language. I tried learning it a bit. I studied Taekwondo for several years wow. and didn't get very far, but uh, really enjoyed it very thoroughly with some wonderful, uh, very interesting lessons and culture fascinating me. You are lacking Asian culture, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Absolutely. So which route do you prefer? For which route? For, for what? For, for your preference, just preference, your gut feelings. I don't know. It's, it's very much a mix. And, you know, when you think, depending which language I speak in, I think differently. Wow. So I think my preference is very depending on the context I'm in and how I'm thinking, which is one of the very interesting things about cross-cultural mediation and negotiation. So you mostly use English in business. Wow. I work primarily in English, mm. but I, there is a lot of French as well. Mm. I occasionally do a bit of work in Spanish. I've mediated in Spanish as well. Mm. And what was really interesting to me in those cases were I thought my Spanish would be the problem. You know, I'm not a native speaker, so I thought I might have more problems. But I realized in one mediation that uh, lawyers from South America, from different countries with Spanish lawyers, they don't always speak the same language, but not quite the same. I think the popular statement from Winston Churchill about the United States and the United Kingdom as two countries divided by a common language. Mm. And it's a bit like I felt that with the, the Spanish mediation. Everybody was speaking Spanish, but the Castilian was different. And some words, even in law, had a different definition. And so there were big legal arguments over what some words meant, mm -hmm. but they were defined differently in each country. So that was interesting. I see. Your life itself is truly international. <laughs> I, that I don't know, but I do enjoy traveling and working in cross-cultural international settings. And, and most of my work that I do in dispute resolution is commercial. So yes, it, that, that does involve travel, which is one of the reasons why very early on I adopted online dispute resolution. Mm -hmm. And so I do a lot of my mediations online. So LawTag is a primarily mediation company? It's a mix. It's the entity through which I do my startups, the entity through which I do my dispute resolution work, it's basically my firm, yeah. So it's kind of jams in US, provide all dispute no. resolution service, no? No, 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 it's a company I set up for my services that I provide. And so if you go to the website of LawTech, you'll see it offers startup services, it offers dispute resolution prevention and resolution services, and it also, I do some other things. So it's all, all there on the website. I see, but that's not a law firm, right? It is a law firm, yes. It's uh, law LawTech firm. is my law firm in Switzerland, yes. Oh, I see. I'm also of counsel to another Swiss firm, which is a more traditional firm with associates and partners. Mm. And I'm still a door tenant with a set of chambers in London mm. because I'm still a certified practicing barrister. Mm. Although I don't run any litigation, mm. I still get involved in mediations occasionally, and that can be under English law very often. I see. I'm asking you a question because mediation is so much gray area between law firm and just advising consulting companies. In some jurisdiction, it's not a law firm. In some jurisdiction, it's law firm. So it's complicated. Look, it's a bit like arbitration. I think the reason why many lawyers leave their law firms is because simply there's conflicts of interest that are too much. When you're working with other colleagues in a firm, you have the conflict of interest because that impartiality and neutrality, whether you're an arbitrator or a mediator is the same. The moment you have a relationship with one of the parties directly, indirectly, it can make people uncomfortable using you as a neutral. So many um, uh, arbitrators and mediators have set up their own law firms. And so that wasn't the reason in my case. I just wanted to work with startups. I wanted to do an eclectic mix of things. No law firm, no, no reasonable law firm would ever ex accept a lawyer working with that mix of things. So I just found my way of doing it and been very happy ever since. I see. When I interview with Manon, I ask Manon, I will ask Jeremy to interview and Manon asked me, why don't you ask AFIM? He's starting a new initiative and French speaking mediation association, something. So <laughs> yes. So, uh, that? so, <laughs> so that's another of the sins I'm guilty of. So when I did my first training in mediation, which is a whole story in itself, it was very Anglo-Saxon approach to mediation. Getting to yes was rational logic behind the book. And, and then I did some more trainings later on in life. I've done many trainings in different countries, but I was really struck when I then did a German-Austrian training. And the Dutch training that Manon has involves elements of that school, which is much more kind of a, just a different view. You know, I'd say 
the getting to yes approach is about getting to yes. The German or Austrian approach is much more about group dynamics and how to get people to reconnect and to be able to speak to one another. So it's got a different kind of social, it's a social process more than it's an outcome oriented process. And then when I started working in French some more and I'd been a mediator with several French institutions like the CMAP and in Switzerland, we have a federal Swiss association and a regional Francophone French commercial mediation association. I started realizing that the Francophones had a third model and it's more a Futac, Tom Futac's wheel with four different phases. It fits with Cartesian logic and uh, it's basically all the Francophone mediation teaching programs tend to teach a model based on Futax wheel. And that leads though to different concepts of mediation as a process. So it's not outcome driven, it's not relationship driven, it's about the process itself and focusing on the process and which stage of the process you're at. And as I said, I started to realize the different French mediators uh, that you have, be they in Europe, be they in North America, be they in Africa, uh, be they, uh, you have French speaking language and you have quite a few countries, there are cultural differences. So we decided to create this Association uh, Francophone Internationale des Mediateurs, so AFIM. It's the first international initiative of Francophone mediators to meet online. We meet once a month, every Wednesday for breakfast, depending which time zone you're in. And we always have a presentation. We compare notes and, you know, we had people in French Polynesia speaking. We've had uh, literally people from all over with very different thoughts and approaches uh, to this. We now have a lot of members from Tunisia, uh, people joining from Morocco, people, all parts of, of Africa are beginning to get interested in this. And it's a fascinating experience for us to realize that we have maybe a common language French, but the, and maybe even a few tax wheel as a common source, but it's really very varied. And sometimes it's good for Francophone mediators to realize that their model is a bit different from the Austrian and German model and different from the US Anglo-Saxon model. Wow, that's quite interesting because getting to yes is kind of Bible in mediation industry. And how about model is model for Singapore International Media Center as well. So, and everyone is studying mediation at Harper's and getting to yes is the first book they That's right. <laughs> recommended. That's very common in the Anglo-Saxon training. So even though they evolve, so you'll have different schools like Gary Friedman will teach you a non-caucus model mm -hmm. that teaches you everybody stays together and you work in joint session. And that's an, an American Anglo-Saxon approach as well. Mm -hmm. It's very different from the typical shuttle diplomacy that was taught in mm -hmm. the very early days of mediation. And people try and mix that today. But again, the basic textbook, as you say, is getting to yes, whereas for the French, it's going to be more few tax wheel. And they might come across getting to yes or the French translation of it. But, and there's lots of similarities, but it's not quite the same concept. I see. And if you can explain one key difference between non-Anglo-Saxon model and Anglo-Saxon model, you know, what would that be? Look, I think the Anglo-Saxon model, as is summarized by getting to yes, it's all about the outcome. Outcome. How do you get people to agree to an outcome? The French approach is not so much about the outcome. It's about the process. Process. Have you followed the process? Have you done the four different steps? Where are you at which stage? Do you want to do another turn? Do you want to focus more on this stage than that stage? Whether you get to an outcome or not mm. is not necessarily what defines a good mediation. Mm. It's the idea that the steps, the parties were able to go through all the steps. And so you focus on the process itself. Put it this way, you're focusing more on the journey than the mm. destination. Whereas the Anglo-Saxon model sometimes is mm. just about the destination. But the journey for the common destination is dispute resolution, right? Yes, but it depends then on what your metrics are for success. Uh, Very often, Anglo-Saxon people will define success as did it settle or not? I see. Did you get an outcome? The French approach, but also the Austrian and German approach is not necessarily was there a deal that was struck, was a, a settlement reached. The question for them is more, for the Austrians is, did people start to listen to one another again? Were they able to re-engage? Were they able to reinstate social interaction? That would be, I guess, the success definition for a German-Austrian mediator. And for the French, it's more, was the process followed? And mm. were they all able to deploy every part of the process so that they had the full opportunity or not? Did they settle or not after that is their choice. So German model focuses on relationship and Swiss model focuses on process itself. So 
Well, it's not the Swiss. The Swiss is kind of a mix. Yes. Um, you, you get some of this in Manon's book, The Variegated Landscape of Mediation. We did this study of 60 different countries, only to discover that no two countries have the same definition of mediation. Mm. They don't have the same culture of mediation. Mm. So coming to back to that joke I was made, making before about England and the United States being divided by a common language, we realize it's the same thing for mediation. We have 60 countries divided by a common word. Mm. We have the new Singapore Convention that talks about mediation. And yet behind the word mediation are very different approaches. Mm. Some countries are pushing of an evaluative neutral mm. who will, has to be a lawyer, for example, and is evaluative and will make a mediator's proposal and say, here's my proposal. And if you don't accept the mediator's proposal, there can be sanctions. That's what some countries have as a model of mediation. And others say, no, the idea of the mediator is should never express an opinion. Mm. He should never be evaluative. They should just sit there and facilitate social interaction mm -hmm. and help the parties focus on the quality of the communications between them. That's great yeah. and to learn because Korea is quite evaluative. Look, I'm not sure that's a Korean specialism because I, I think that when lawyers get more involved in mediation, it tends to become more evaluative. As lawyers were driven by outcome, were driven by winning, losing, the legal syllogism, what are the facts, what are the law, what should the outcome be when you apply these norms, which are law and fact? And so when lawyers get more involved, mm. you tend to unconsciously even be more evaluative. And I think maybe the Austrian German approach was much more family oriented, therapy oriented question originally about Jung and psychotherapy or psychoanalysis. It's not so much linked to what I do, but I do think some of the big differences mm. of mediation being a social process is heavily in influenced by the notion of social science and especially psychotherapy. Yes, I do think that that there are links in some of these things, but it's cultural and where, how do we define culture and where does it start? Where does it stop? It's about a group behavior and lawyers have a culture and law lawyers have a different culture. I see. And while one of the key thing I have learned from Tolkien Academy, one of your classes is omnipartiality. Before listening to your class, I think neutrality is the best norm, but after listening, no one can be neutral and omnipartiality <laughs> and wow, this is it. I'm very surprised. <laughs> and but for someone who don't know about omnipartiality, can you explain the key difference from omnipartiality yeah. and neutrality? Certainly. And and again, this is just my my approach to the topic and another mediator will have a different one. That's where we are at currently in the profession. We all have our own definitions. We all have our own understandings mm -hmm. and they can vary a lot. But my understanding is, first of all, the three principles for mediation. A mediator has to be independent. He has to be impartial and he has to be neutral. Okay. So what do those three words mean? Okay. Independent means you don't depend on the parties for any one outcome. You're not dependent on them. The notion of neutrality for me is also neutrality as to the outcome. Do they settle? Do they not settle? For me, that's where the neutrality comes in. You know, it's the idea that whether they settle, if they don't settle, it's in favor of one party, or the other party. At the end of the day, you're neutral in terms of the outcome. It doesn't affect you. Partiality is a much more con difficult concept. What does partial mean? It means you're leaning more to one side than, on, than to the other. And my understanding of the human brain is such that we are always uh, trying, especially when trying to work as mediators, we're trying to connect with the other side. We're trying to, we're in fact trying to be partial every time. If we want to be in a situation where we can empathize with a person and feel their feelings, we can't talk about impartiality. We're very partial to them at that moment. The point is though, we need to be equally partial to everybody so that if we're going to be empathizing, we're going to have to empathize with both parties and equally. Now, is that possible or not? Technically, I'm not sure how we can measure this objectively, but the idea of omnipartiality is to say, don't pretend that you're not partial, just be equally partial with everybody. And so the idea is that when you go into a caucus, if you're going to have a very emotional conversation with somebody, you really want to engage with them. Do you have you lost? Well, I don't think it's affected your neutrality in terms of the outcome. It might have, they might spill into one another. It doesn't affect your independence in terms of your ability to operate it, but it might affect your partiality vis-a-vis -vis the other party. If you've had an intense caucus with one party only, and they've 
bared their emotions to you and you've had a really cathartic moment with them understanding what makes them go but the other side never provides you with that opportunity then you might have a partiality there and so for me what's really important is to make sure there's equal partiality from that point of view and i and that is referred to as omni partiality equal but everywhere does i hope that answers the question for you yes yes equal to everyone right and absolutely and compassion is kind of a brain activity not through sensory system but our brain feels compassion and i think and as a mediator while doing that omnipartiality omni compassion and by caucusing each other and caucusing spending too much time then your compassion goes to compassion fatigue area because judge or arbitrator never give any compassion right they need to be objective and they need to be rational or logical but mediator <laughs> need to have compassion to both party equally then i think there should be some kind of fatigue generated by compassion so so it's very interesting that you use the word compassion for that and actually when you look at neuroscience we have to uh, separate between empathy and compassion mm -hmm. they're not the same thing mm -hmm. and the areas of the brain that are activated are different mm -hmm. so when you are in empathy you are trying to get to a state where you can feel another person's emotions you're literally in their shoes you can understand their perspective of the world but more than understanding it you can also feel it mm -hmm. and so many mediation courses in parts of the world will spend you know even three four five days on training you in your skills to be in empathy and how do you become empathetic how do you create that response that mirroring that you can get between two people where you really understand what the other person is feeling and not just what they are saying on the other hand, compassion is very different because with empathy, you do get that spiraling and that fatigue you referred to. It's very difficult to go and work every day and be with people in empathy, especially when they're telling you exactly the opposite from one another. You know, they hate one another, there's anger between them, and you're trying to be in empathy with both, and it can get very confusing, and it can very easily lead to burnout and a form of emotional fatigue if you do that. And also you can spiral negatively if you are with a person who's depressed and everything is terrible and sad for them, then it is possible that that will affect you as well. And so you need to kind of accept the fact that you can spiral negatively as well. And then it's very difficult to go back to positive state of mind if you've been empathizing in that way. So what do you do? Some people will say, well, never get into empathy, remain factual, remain objective, do not get caught in the empathy sinkhole that can suck you down and draw you into something. And so some people really like to separate emotion from what they believe is factual and objective. But frankly, there's a lot of subconscious activity going on. And so it's very difficult to be objective, I believe, ever. Compassion, though, is different. We've seen there's a study, and if you want, uh, there's a little video on the topic by Professor Olga Klimicki, who goes and explains really different parts of the brain that are involved with compassion and with empathy. So in empathy, you want to feel the other person's emotions. With compassion, you simply want the person well. And so if you think of all forms of meditation, like a Tibetan loving kindness meditation, for example, you can wish a person well, knowing that that is not you. And being motivated by the well-being for another person is easier, especially if you're motivated equally for that well-being for both parties. So being in a state of compassion in a way is healthier because it avoids the negative spiraling it's been found scientifically than empathy. So it's very easy to be in compassion constantly without having that fatigue or that tiredness you're talking about because it's a different state of mind. So I think all these courses that are training about empathy might want to do more training on compassion as opposed to empathy and understanding the difference between the two, because it's a very important distinction. Partially, I could understand because without having empathy, have compassion with both party. Is it possible? <laughs> without feeling any emotion of each party, having compassion means understanding factual matter and the positional matter and see their emotion objectively and not so, feeling their emotion so, and somehow confusing so, it is a bit confusing so my premise is 
no human being is ever going to be fully objective. We can't be. We ourselves have emotions, and if you follow Kahneman's thinking fast and slow and heuristic patterns of rapid thinking in the brain, we all have pre-conscious attitudes and beliefs that we are not even aware of that influence our perception of everything. So it's very difficult for us to ever be in pure objectivity. We are all subjective animals. We are hardwired that way genetically and environmentally. We are partial animals, we are tribal animals, mm. and as a result, we will resonate more with some, less with others, and we have to understand that and be aware of it. Now, what you're talking about is something different about emotions and needs. If you look at the teachings of Rosenfeld, Marshall Rosenfeld for Nonviolent Communication, he was a great believer that emotions are very useful in conflict because an emotion reflects an unmet need. The stronger the emotion, the stronger the unmet need. So his approach to looking at emotions was as a diagnostic tool, in an objective way, in a way. You can see a person is very angry, a person is very sad, a person is overly happy. There's something going on linked to needs and interests that is worth exploring. Mm. And so they are gateways mm. to a conversation mm. about emotion, so you can really identify the emotion linked to the need. So they're very helpful, mm. but it doesn't necessarily mean you need to be in that same state of mind. Just because the other person is sad doesn't mean I need to be sad to understand them. I see. And the idea of compassion is I wish them well. It doesn't necessarily mean that I have to be sad myself. I, I don't know who is a figurehead for you to think about, but many people kind of think about Mother Teresa, the person who used to work in Calcutta and dedicated her life to helping the sick and the poor. How could she have done and seen what she did every day? Now, religion might help and so on, but the belief is that she was in a constant state of compassion. Waking up every day, her desire was to help others. So even though she was surrounded by misery and suffering, her ability and desire to help others were able to keep her going without that negative spiraling. Although she must have had some bad days like any human being. And that's a bit the state of mind. We want to try and avoid, if you think of it from a neuroscience perspective, the risk of getting pulled in too far, the risk of spiraling negatively. Mm. But we want to be able to understand the feelings mm -hmm. and it's not quite sympathy where you're just aware of the idea mm -hmm. because we need the emotional motivation to want to help as well and so i think that state of wanting to help is what it's about for wow. mediators now i understand maybe 50 percent of that differences and on last interview with son Ong, executive director of smc and he mentioned that emotion is kind of spices in mediation and the previous interview with Delsian and she mentioned that if you're truly trying to help somebody then they will open their mind and I think compassion is kind of that thing if we we truly want both party to open their mind and talk to each other and want to solve their problem then they will open their mind and we are in the area of compassion not, not empathy am I correct it, it, there is an element of that, and I like the analogy of the spices. For me, spices, some people like spices, some people don't like spices, some people like certain sorts of spices. There's a sense of preference and an ability to change. For me, emotions are partly who we are as an animal, as, as a social animal. Human beings are de facto emotional. If you look at the brain and what the neuroscience tells us mm -hmm. is that all of our five senses are first processed through the limbic system and via emotions. Mm -hmm. We, in zero to 400 milliseconds, everything we smell, taste, touch, see, everything is first going through the limbic system. It's mm -hmm. the amygdala together with the thalamus, but primarily in the amygdala where there's a very rapid triage in zero to 400 milliseconds done in the brain that says, is there a potential danger for me here? Mm. Or is there a potential reward for me here? And depending on that, it will then activate different parts of the brain. And so if we are in fear, we'll behave and think a certain way. But if we believe there's a reward, we might think and behave differently. And all of this happens 400 milliseconds is before your brain has time for conscious thinking. Mm. Conscious thinking can only start at 500 milliseconds after that. So in a way, the limbic system is hijacking your cognitive prefrontal cortex. How am I going to be able to think about this objectively? Emotions are always there. We do our diagnostics unconsciously in zero to 400 milliseconds through emotions. 
the emotions we perceive in others, another person's fear or sense of reward, but also what do they trigger in terms of our own feelings? And then we get caught up in that unconsciously. There's been lots of very interesting experiments done where one word, for example, changes behavior. So they've done a word with groups of people who've been given money and they've been, one group was told you can keep 20% and gamble or you can gamble to keep the full amount of money. And the other group were told you can lose 80% or you can gamble or whatever the numbers were exactly. And when the word keep was used, most people chose not to gamble. But the word was, but you can lose or gamble. Most people chose to gamble. That was that simple keep or lose word that we could see had an effect in zero to 300 milliseconds on which part of the brain was getting oxygen and glucose. And that had a kind of an, an avalanche effect on the rest of the thinking for those people who remained rational. They just didn't realize that one word had triggered a different pathway of thinking in the brain. And what we see now, we've done some fascinating experiments recently we've been able to compare people in mediation and people in negotiation. So we've had teams of people who were given instructions on how to negotiate a topic that was of concern to them. And then with another group, the same people with, you know, similar cases were brought in with a mediator and we're able to see different parts of the brain are activated when a mediator is present and involved. And it's got to do with sense with some of the reward mechanisms and a sense of optimism, but it's, this is just very early stages mm. of this research. And our research is, I'd say like medieval times, we're looking at shadows and trying to interpret things, but our technology is not really there yet. Mm. So we have to be very careful about saying anything about neuroscience. Still, it's very interesting. And, um, we're beginning to see some of the shadows take shape mm. and some of it makes sense and some of it, but we'll see it's, it's early days still. I love your analogy. We are living in middle age of neuroscience. And I think you are Renaissance man. <laughs> no, definitely not because I'd be inventing. I'm simply trying to understand what I have the great fortune of working with a lot of neuroscientists mm. who've educated me, but it's always difficult at times to, you know, it's very complex. And so when we're trying to do an experiment or a trial mm. to isolate the one thing we're trying to look at to make sure there's you no, know, so even how do you have a group that you mediate with and a group you do a negotiation with, you have to come up with some tricks. So for the people who are negotiating, we had a lab technician sitting with him at the table and we said, you know, he's not involved. He's just here to record the measures mm -hmm. of the instruments because we were looking at skin conductance and all sorts of other things that were being measured. And so the excuse for a person sitting at the table with them was he's the lab technician, but it makes a difference if it's actually the mediator who's engaging. And so. It wasn't the presence or absence of the third person making the difference. It was really the role they were taking as sitting there passively observing a conversation or a person who was helping people to focus in their discussions on their needs and interests and the solutions for them.